unless you've got a really long intro. I, I would be very, very cautious about that. What about the outcomes? Then if we look, come back to our series, we, uh, um, uh, I think these are interesting data which help inform patients with colitis. If we looked at all of our patients, 750 diagnosed and follow-up in Oxford, the colectomy rate was 12%, 12.4%. But if you took those who had one episode or more of acute severe colitis, the 25%, then that went up to 40%, 39.8%. Whereas in those who never admitted, it was 3%. And, um, and this is very, very similar to data from David Binion, which was published uh, um, a couple of years ago. And so I think has a ring of credibility. And it shows that patients with colitis fall into these two cohorts. An admission, and that puts your colectomy rate up to 40% at some stage during your, 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 the duration of your disease, or avoiding colectomy altogether. And I've mentioned the, the chance of a second episode of acute severe colitis. But if you look at all of our colectomies in Oxford, out of the whole 750, by far and away the majority were for acute severe colitis. Look at this malignancy figure. Why do we get all so excited about, about displays from malignancy? The reason coming to colectomy is, is actually pretty uncommon. I think we just need to keep that in, in, uh, in perspective. And that figure too, almost seven years to time of colectomy, is also, I think, quite an interesting one. What if we follow up our patients from the 1996 uh, cohort? We could, um, if they were divided into those who had a complete response at day seven, in other words, no visible blood, and uh, a stool frequency of less than three a day, or an incomplete response where they still had uh, um, blood or a stool frequency above three times a day on the seventh day of admission, you can see that they again separate out in that the incomplete responders, half had come to collect me the 12 months and three quarters over the follow-up period. And I think what that tells us, and numbers are incredibly small, but it sort of tells us that, hey, if you've had an incomplete response to an admission, you're deferring collectomy. That's really what the cyclosporin data, and I'm sure what the infliximab long-term follow-up data will, 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 will show us. So, just for acute severe colitis, I think you need to think there are objective criteria and the number of criteria give you a steer on the outcome, so count them and adjust your approach accordingly when you're um, dealing with inpatients. You've got objective criteria for assessing the initial response to steroids on the basis of the CRP and, and, and frequency. But you need to act on the use of the indices, but for goodness sake, make some decisions around it or start preparing them. Pick up the phone and phone a friend if you are uncertain what to do because I think ducking difficult decisions is what actually leads on to some of the problems. So I'll move straight on, if I may, to the ulcerative colitis activity index, partly because it's new, but also because it relates back to the mission side. That one hand did go up. So, so Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I didn't give you any any. Data. Can I address that on the uh, at the end on because that's I am sad to say that's opinion based and not evidence based. But it is. Uh, but I. But the. Um, but perhaps I can address that just then because I think it's it's a, it's a it's a fair um, question. So, let's change gear. Um, one of the other things I've been involved in was, is leading a group over the past few years, um, and I dare say sort of many of the names will be fairly familiar, um, with, with outstanding statisticians as well as IBD specialists, in trying to bring a bit of um, objective assessment to endoscopy. And the background is, is, is this, that there really is no objective measure of endoscopic activity of ulcerative colitis which has been validated. And because the intra-observer variation affects both clinical decisions and, believe me, regulatory decisions, as well as clinical trial outcomes, we really thought that we ought to, to, to try and address that. And so we developed the, what's called the UCIS in, in three phases. We first of all got together at DDW 2007 to try and define the level of disagreement between people who might have thought themselves, even if others didn't, that they knew what they were looking at, um, and trying to break down the complex in image analysis into different descriptors and to assign severity levels to them. 
We then took an, another group and defined the inter, in tribes of variability for each descriptor, uh, published and presented at DDW a little while back, but now impressed with, with, with gut. And, and the third phase, which we'll be presenting at UEGW in a few weeks' time, um, was validating that. And I'm afraid this is fairly detailed, but just it helps to understand the process. So we took these 10 um, uh, uh, um, specialists from both sides of the uh, Atlantic, and they were asked to grade 18 videos according to their own practice, not to use the Barron score or anything like that, but simply from a, from a, um, a selection of, of videos which we had uh, um, uh, um, uh, stored from a, from a clinical trial performed a, a couple of years previously, where the videos had been, video sigmoidoscopies had been um, videoed and performed in a very standardized manner. And we um, took a group, uh, covering the range of severity, randomly uh, assigned the videos, and they were core videos. And um, we had to somehow use uh, an index to, to, to uh, grade their severity. So on that, we, we just used an independent evaluator, the, the, the Barron score. And then we took what we, we, we felt we could distill out, 10 descriptors of severity. And I'll explain what these were in a moment. But the overall severity was assessed simply according to a visual analog scale. There is no gold standard, so we needed a reference point. So we took a central reader, the central reader who had been originally involved in the in the in in the study um, of a, of a peptide which hasn't seen the light of day actually, um, and we compared our readings with that of this central reader, and then we took the different descriptors, and you can see here vascular pattern, erythema, mucosal surface, you know, all this stuff about granularity, friability, whatever that means, and so on. Um, and we assigned Likert scales, and we held a Delphi procedure to give very precise definitions of them, um, and then we looked at, we, 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 as I say, compared it with the, um, with the videos, and this is what we found initially. So you've got these 10 um, self-appointed experts down, um, the, 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 who are the authors. And you can see that compared to the central reader who assigned sort of a, um, videos in remission, that only 30% of us agreed and half thought that it was, um, uh, um, uh, it was uh, mildly active and 20% 20, 20 thought that moderately active. We're a bit better in the severely active group with three quarters uh, reckoning, agreeing with the central reader that they were severely active. The point that that slide shows is just that we were all over the place. And so this to us said, mission control, we have a problem. We cannot agree between ourselves even defining no activity in ulcerative colitis and, and not, mu not much better in, in, uh, in uh, uh, severe colitis and, of course, all over the shop in, 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 in moderate colitis. So that led on to phase two. So we took 30 new investigators um, from uh, US, Canada, and, and various uh, European countries who were experienced, uh, experienced colonoscopists. They scored, we took 60 different uh, um, recordings and we added, because the original Carl had been for, 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 for moderately active disease, we took, we, we wanted to make sure we covered the full range of spheres, so we took five normal and five severe colitis, so severe they were about to come to, to uh, uh, colectomy in some cases, and we wanted to assess uh, the, something called the contact friability test, which is a way of formalizing how you assess friability. Friability is the ease with which the mucosa will bleed on light like, touch, and usually an endoscopist just reckon they, t they touch the surface with the tip of the endoscope, but here we were using closed biopsy forceps just to impact on the mucosa and come away and see whether it bled, and this was really trying to formalize it, and um, you'll see that it didn't work. Um, so they were randomly assessed, uh, they would given a CD which um, uh, contained this uh, uh, a variety of the videos, some of the core videos, some of the duplicates because we wanted to uh, look at um, uh, intra-observed variation and uh, randomized by Latin squares and again scored according to the um, to, 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 uh, 0 to 100 visual analog scale. And these were the cappers and I suspect most people are familiar with the caps. It's a, it's an, it's a way of statistically evaluating uh, inter-observed agreement, and one is perfect, naught is, uh, um, is, is perfect um, uh, um, disagreement other than that beyond uh, chance, and 
it's pretty poor. Look, vascular pattern, the, the, um, the, that, uh, uh, between readers, the kappa was only 0.4, and as for, for friability, really about 0.3, 0.4, that's pretty poor agreement. It's about as good as pathology gets without careful training, actually looking at biopsies of osteocolitis. No pathologist here, um, but it's true. 